Okay. Hello. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Mark Rendell, and I have brought you here to talk to you about cloudnative.net. And this talk is being done using my handcrafted slide app, uh, which is created in .NET Core 2.0, and which interacts with an online service called Deck Hub. And you can go to deckhub.app now on your device, and there's a little search box on the front page, and you can type in there cloud-native-net, and then you can join in with the talk. You'll see the slides will appear on your device. If you log in using Twitter, then you can take notes, and those notes will then be there for you to use in the future. Uh, and you can ask questions, and I have a little extra screen attached to my laptop here, and the questions will pop up on the screen. So you can join in with the talk, and you don't have to interrupt or put your hand up or anything like that. And Deck Hub is an open source project. It's MIT licensed. It's on GitHub. There's a link on the home page of the website that will take you to GitHub, and you can get all the code download it, do whatever you want with it. If you do start a business with it and it makes tens of millions of dollars, then buy me something nice. Um, but yes, so, and I'll be using that as my demonstration samples uh, throughout the course of the talk. So to start off, let's define what cloud native actually means. It does not mean building applications that only run on Azure, or only run on AWS, or only run, only run on some cloud platform. Um, it's actually almost the opposite of that. It's building applications that run on any cloud, um, or on any approximation of a cloud that you might be able to put together in your own data center. The cloud native foundation, which was started to bring together a group of projects that are aiming to build the ecosystem for this uh, approach to development. They define cloud native as generally consisting of microservices. Uh, those microservices are mostly running in containers. You're using platform services that are outside of that container environment for things like databases, file storage, uh, service bus messaging, and so on. And also a strong uh, emphasis on DevOps and the whole idea of continuous integration, continuous testing, and even continuous deployment, although that's really scary and you should only do it if you absolutely know what you're doing. So it's important when you start giving a talk to explain to people why they might want to adopt the approach that you're talking about. And for cloud native application development, there are a bunch of reasons, um, not least because it's new and exciting and you get to learn new things and play with new toys. Um, so there you go, that's, that's basically it. That's good enough for me. But no, there's a lot of great tooling around uh, the cloud native ecosystem, and you can achieve an awful lot with tools that already exist, are well documented, lots of books about them, and so you can just dive in and get on with stuff and not worry about building your own tooling and everything else. And similarly, there's an ecosystem that has grown up around the things that are forming the, the cloud native ecosystem itself. So we've got lots of things as a service, uh, things that work with Docker, things that work with Kubernetes, things that provide logging and metrics and, and everything else. You also have uh, kind of implicit scalability. So if you design your application in a cloud native way, then you're going to automatically get the benefits of being able to scale upward and outward very easily 
using the tools in the ecosystem that already exists. And because you can run your applications on commodity infrastructure, uh, you can generally save a lot of cost as well. You don't have to upfront say, right, well, we're hoping to scale this service up to 100,000 users or a million users, so we'll have to invest in servers that are capable of supporting that before you've actually started launching darkly and got your first 1,000 users. Uh, so you can keep your costs low for as long as possible. And by making sure you can jump around between clouds, you can also uh, avoid vendor lock-in and migrate to whichever is currently offering the best deal for your particular set of requirements. So, let's start off with point one, microservices, because it is illegal in 2018 uh, to be at a tech conference and stand up here and do a talk that isn't about microservices. Um, I, I read that somewhere um, in a Martin Fowler book, I think. There's a lot of people talking about microservices and a lot of debates raging on Twitter about what constitutes a microservice and how small should they be and how do you decide whether something should be one service or two or three different microservices. You know, how small is too small? How big is too big? How do I decide where to make the cut between two things? And it's very difficult with all the different arguments and different articles and everything that are available to decide whether you're doing it right. And I have come to the conclusion that as long as it's working for you, then it's probably right. Uh, there are lots of different advantages to microservice architectures. One of my favorite ones, personally, that I don't see mentioned a lot, is when you're working in a large team of teams, microservices make it very easy for individual teams to work independently on a vertical slice of the application, and they can keep their test suite nice and small because it's only testing one particular set of things, and then there's integration testing that happens, obviously, to make sure that everything's interacting properly with everything else. But as a counterexample, currently for my day job, I'm working for one of the large banks, working on a WPF application that consists of 125 C-sharp projects in a single solution. There are 25,000 unit tests covering this. When you do a check-in, it automatically runs all 25,000 unit tests twice because there are two different configurations of this application. That takes about an hour and a half. By the time those tests have run, you go back and you go, right, can you merge my pull request, please? And the system says no, because somebody else's pull request got merged in the meantime, and an app.config file got updated, and now there's a merge conflict, and so you need to resolve that. And once you've resolved it, you do another push, and then you spend an hour and a half running the tests again. It's very difficult. We have 100 developers fighting each other to, to get their commits in and merged. And microservices is a great way around that because you take that from being 125 projects down to maybe five projects. And you have a test suite that takes maybe a minute and a half to run instead of an hour and a half to run. And you have maybe four developers working on the thing instead of 400. So that's one advantage of microservices, and there are many more. My rules of thumb for microservices, uh, basically they should be self-contained. So they should have a responsibility. It's like the single responsibility principle from object-oriented programming. You can apply that to microservices. So they should be self-contained, they should do one thing, and they should do it well. A microservice should own its own data store. It shouldn't be writing to the same data store as any other microservice. You certainly shouldn't be updating the same table in the same database from two different microservices. One of them has to be responsible for owning it. Ideally, and if you take this up to the kind of big companies where they've got the money to spend on machines and services and everything else, then every microservice should have its own uh, actual database server or servers that it's using. And uh, their database should be on there. So 
you get the resilience uh, aspect where if one of the services goes down or if one of the back-end databases goes down, you lose the one service that's dependent on that back-end database, but all the others quite happily keep going. If you have a point of failure that causes three separate microservices to go down, they're not three separate microservices. And the other um, useful metric is if a microservice goes away, does everything still carry on working for some value of working? My screen down here is glitching, and so I'm slightly thrown. Um, so yes, can the rest of the system carry on running in a slightly less useful way if one of those microservices suddenly disappears because of a network partition or a machine catching fire or a cleaner unplugging the server rack or something like that? So microservices should generally be removable. And yes, you're going to have some that are less removable than others, some that are more important. If you have a microservice for your shopping cart and that goes down, then your e-commerce site has become marginally less useful than it was when the shopping cart was working. So the example I'm going to use here is the, the deck hub um, dot app. So the, the various services that I've got running to provide. Can we just start chanting the word microservice? Yes. Yes, you can, absolutely. Um, but thank you so much for actually using the thing. <laughs> because it's much better when people do that. And uh, the first five times I gave this talk, it didn't even work. So it's always very nice when the first question appears on my little screen here. And I go, yay, it's working. Also, I've just mined all your data. Um, no. <laughs> so, um, Deck Hub uh, provides various bits of functionality. So, there is the main website, and then you enter the tag, and you press enter, and it takes you off to the shows um, area, and within there, you can join a show, and you'll be able to see the slide that's there, and theoretically, as I move my slides along, it should just get magically moved along on your screen because of real-time messaging that's going on here. And you can ask questions, and I can receive the questions here. And uh, you can make notes, and those notes will get saved. And so there are lots of different services involved in making that happen. And they all look like a single website because of the way the thing has been put together in production, the way it's actually set up to run. But they're all separate services. So there is a main website service, there is a shows service, there's a question service, there's a notes service, there is a real-time service, there's a presenter service, which only I get to use because I've got an API key. Uh, there is an identity service. So if you've created an ASP.NET MVC or core MVC website uh, and you say, use individual authentication, it puts a whole area into your website under identity with account slash login, register, manage, and, and everything else. And I've actually pulled that out and put it into a completely separate standalone service. And that deals with the identity database and everything else, and it sets a cookie, and then that cookie is used in all the other pages to authenticate the user using a JWT token. Now, if the identity service goes down, then you can't log in, so you can't ask questions, and you can't make notes. But you can still search for a show and see the slides going along um, as, as I'm progressing them up here. If the question service goes down, then you can still log in and you can take notes, but you can't ask any questions. If the note service goes down, you can still log in, you can watch the show, you can ask questions, but you can't take any notes, and so on and so forth. And eventually, I will get to the point where I've done some progressive web app stuff, and you'll be able to take notes, and it'll save them into local storage, and then synchronize when the note service becomes available again. So you can then log in on another machine. Um, if the real-time service goes down, then you can still sort of follow along with the show, but it just won't automatically advance when I do things. So almost everything except the actual core website itself 
can go down, and the core website is pretty much just static HTML at this point. There's not a lot in there. Um, so this is, a, theoretically, it's a robust application. It's actually all using a single database server because I can't afford multiple database servers. So if the database server goes down, the whole thing's shot. But that is uh, a problem of economy on my part and not with the design of the application itself. So let's take a look at what this looks like. Um, I'm going to be using Visual Studio Code to show stuff here. And the first thing I want to make clear, can everyone see this all right up at the back there? Yeah, because if it gets much bigger, then you can't really see very much on the screen. So you can see down here we've got a, a, a CLI and an identity and a live and a notes presenter, various things. These are all separate solutions. And if you follow the link through to the GitHub organization, Deck Hub app, you'll see that they're all separate Git repositories. So they're all handled independently of each other. And that's a pain in the backside for me because I am the only person working on this. But when you have large teams or even just four people who are responsible for lots of different things, this makes your life much easier. Um, having separate repos means fewer commit uh, conflicts, fewer merge problems, and also much easier continuous integration, continuous testing, continuous deployment, because you're not having to say, okay, which thing within this repo changed. So let's, we'll start out by looking at um, the live service. So this is the main web service here. This is all now running on ASP.NET Core uh, 2.1 release candidate one, which came out on Monday. And I've spent most of the week updating the software and getting it working in that new environment. So we have my, uh, my live code here. And um, here is my ASP.NET Core application. And I have my program.cs uh, here, which is perfectly standard. And then I have my startup.cs here. And the main thing that's, um, that's tricky with this is making sure that the cookies that are set by the identity application, the identity service, are acceptable to this application as well. I want the same cookie that's set by one service to work for all the other services. Um, that was literally the only difficult thing, and it wasn't even that difficult. So if I go down to the configure auth method uh, down here, you can see that we have add authentication, cookie authentication, defaults authentication scheme, and add cookie. So we're just saying use, uh, use cookie authentication. And it's a JWT token. It's a, a serialized token with uh, the user information put into it that goes into a cookie. And to get that to work across multiple services, you have to use uh, data protection configuration. So ASP.NET Core has uh, extensive data protection library. And what that includes is a private key that is used to sign the cookie that is put into the user's browser. And then when that comes back in, it's checked against that private key to make sure it hasn't been tampered with so nobody can edit the cookie and change their username to somebody else's username. And to get that working across multiple services, and even if you just create a single ASP.NET Core application and everything happens in a single project because it's not that complicated, if you're going to be running more than one instance of it, you need to do this anyway. Uh, you have to configure some way that the data protection keys can be shared between all those services. And they provide various ways of doing that in NuGet packages. That's that monitor. It's buzzing at me now. Excellent. Nearly made it through the whole conference. Just, just 40 more minutes. Um, so yes, we have, uh, we say services, we're going to add data protection, and then we're going to set the application name. That's the important bit there. 
the application name is Deck Hub, and everything, all the different services have that same application name, and they're going to persist the keys into Redis, which is a nice, simple place to, to stick things. We don't have to authenticate against it. We just stick up a Redis server inside our cluster, and everything can see it, and they use that to share the keys around. And so uh, we're going to add data protection. We're going to disable automatic key generation, and we're going to set the application name. Uh, oh, no, hang on. So this is, this is the production code. Uh, so this does it in Redis. And then this is the local code, um, which doesn't do that, because uh, I don't need that when I'm running locally. OK. Um, yep, that's, that's pretty much all of that. The identity application um, does the actual business of logging people in. And this is just an ASP.NET Core um, application where I scaffolded all the identity pages in. So ASP.NET Core 2.1 does the identity code as Razor Pages UI. And so I just got all that in. It puts it into an identity um, area inside the application. And I'm really slightly vexed that they decided in ASP.NET Core that they were still going to support areas. Obviously, various customers came back to them and said, we liked areas, please put areas back in. But if you're breaking your application up into areas, you should be breaking it up into multiple services. Even if you're not breaking your application up into areas, you should probably be breaking it up into multiple services. So areas are definitely a bad idea. So I just ripped everything out of the areas. And then uh, we're in here. And so we've got more complicated stuff going on in here. We've got uh, various identity bits. We've got the default UI um, that's going in there. And here we have our add authentication. And I can say add Twitter um, and specify my Twitter consumer key and secret. And uh, in fairly soon, I'll be adding in add Microsoft, so you can log in with your Microsoft account, and add Google, so you can log in with your Google account, and not Facebook, because I don't like Facebook, um, which I'm allowed to do, or not. So yes, but this is almost entirely just the scaffolding code from an ASP.NET uh, application with individual authentication. And I just ripped it out and uh, put it into its own site. The other thing that's in here, though, that is going to be important later on is if we go down to, is everyone sort of familiar enough with ASP.NET Core that I don't need to explain the startup class? Um, so you've got configure services, which is dependency injection, and then configure, which is where you set up your pipeline. And the configure um, code down here, we have just the usual things, use static files, use cookie policy, use authentication. Um, but just here, we've got something called uh, use path base. So this is what's used in the production code to say this application is going to be running under slash identity or some directory on the web server. And we'll see how that's actually handled on the web server side of things very shortly. Um, and then we have uh, various other applications. So we have a, a shows application. So this is what you're using if you've actually got the, uh, <clears throat> been looking at Auth0. Yes, so, uh, sorry, I'll come back to that in a moment. See, it's nice being able to ask, have questions asynchronously, and it makes me read them out as well, which is great for the video. Um, so yes, I, the, Application you're using is the show service. That's sharing cookies and, and everything else. Um, if you're getting the questions coming through onto your screen in real time, that's the SignalR service, which is sitting in real time. And I've got various advantages to working like this. One of them is that when I came to upgrade from ASP.NET Core 2.1 Preview 2 to Release Candidate 1, I could do it one service at a time. I didn't have to sit there and make sure the entire thing worked with the new RC1 and the various breaking changes that were in there. I could just deploy bits of the application 
that were upgraded. Um, one of the things that's in there is that the identity application, because the identity pages are still using Bootstrap 3 as their styling uh, code, so the identity microservice has Bootstrap 3 and various older bits of JavaScript and CSS in it, whereas all the others have got Bootstrap 4.1.1 and uh, newer jQuery and everything else. Um, so that's in there, and then we have uh, the presenter microservice, um, which is where my command line application that's actually generating the slides is communicating with the presenter service to say, here, um, this slide is now available. Uh, there's also a slides service which literally does nothing but accept streams of bytes, assume that they're JPEGs and put them into Azure Blob Storage and then get them back out again when you ask for them. That's all it does. Um, that's a tiny little microservice. Um, so, yes. Uh, I'm just going to go back to my slides and try and remember where I am. Okay, so... Been looking at Auth0, any reason you didn't do um, Auth as a service to keep it simple, or would that not be simpler? Uh, the reason I'm not using Auth0 is because it's expensive. And it's not hugely expensive for what it does, it's just very expensive when all you want is a little demo application to do in a talk. Um, Auth0 provide a great service, and if you're building something uh, big, then I absolutely recommend using them or one of those other, you know, Azure A, D, B to C or whatever we've got now. Um, so yes, using external services for things like authentication is, is very um, sensible. Uh, the Redis server, isn't the Redis server a single point of failure? Um, it is, but it's not doing anything uh, particularly important. Once the service is up and running, it doesn't go back to the Redis server to get the data protection key. So until you restart a service or update a service, then uh, you don't have to worry about whether the Redis server is there or not. You'll lose some of the messaging that it's also being used for, but again, that's something that the application can carry on running without. Um, if you are concerned about Redis as a point of failure for key sharing, then you could use something like Azure Blob Storage, which is less likely to go away, but uh, you're generally okay with... Um, with using Redis for transient uh, bits of code like that. Okay. So, the various components in here, we have ASP.NET Core 2.1, uh, release candidate one, which gives you an awful lot of stuff out of the box, not least of which is absolutely bonkers performance. So, I can run these services on fairly small virtual machines in the cloud and uh, still get enough performance that the 40 or so people who come to my talks can uh, follow along quite happily. I'm using PostgreSQL, um, so Entity Framework Core, there is a PostgreSQL provider for that, which works very nicely, and PostgreSQL does everything I need, and it's cheaper to run than uh, Microsoft SQL Server. Um, Redis is in there, Redis is used for PubSub messaging inside the application between various components, and also for sharing the keys around the place. Um, the sharing the keys, part of the reason I'm using Redis for that is just because I don't have to worry about putting in connection strings for Azure Blob Storage or, or anything else. And then inside Azure, I am using Blob Storage for, uh, for the slides. That's where the slides get stored. Some of the services will be using Table Storage instead of PostgreSQL for uh, user data. And I'm also using Service Bus, and this is another important point with microservice architecture, is you don't, uh, as far as possible, you want to avoid synchronous communication between services. So you don't want to have a post that goes from the web to your service that then causes a post to another service and then has to wait for that to complete before the response is returned to the user. Um, you want to use messaging as far as possible. So, for example, when I move the slide along, that goes to the presenter service um, and says, I've moved this slide along. The presenter service puts a message onto Azure Service Bus saying, this slide is now available. 
which gets picked up by a background process in the show service, and then that updates the show's database because the show service is responsible for the show's database. And there are various other messages that go around over service bus as well. If the service that processes the messages on service bus isn't there, they'll sit there for a day until a service consumes them. If it hasn't consumed them after a day, it'll just throw them onto a dead letter queue and I can come back and say, why didn't that get picked up? So those are the various uh, bits and pieces that the application is using. Um, <clears throat> getting it into production is a matter of wrapping things up in Docker images so that we can run them in containers and then using Kubernetes uh, to orchestrate those containers, manage them inside the cloud and get them all talking to each other and everything else. Docker, you can get Docker for Windows, which runs on top of Hyper-V. You can get Docker for Mac, which runs on top of Docker's own hypervisor for Mac OS. Uh, you can get Docker for Linux, just by doing apt install Docker. Um, there's some repo stuff you have to do, but that generally works. Um, <clears throat> Docker for Windows and Docker for Mac both now also include Kubernetes. You have to turn it on, because it's an optional thing, but you can say, I want my local Docker instance to also be a single node Kubernetes cluster, and you can use all the Kubernetes tools against that as well, which is great. And Microsoft are enthusiastically supporting Docker. Uh, if you go to hub.docker.com slash u slash Microsoft, you can see there dozens of repositories that they've got in there. Uh, they've got, uh, they did have an ASP.NET core repository, but that's been deprecated now. It's all just .NET. So many different .NET images. There are .NET images based on uh, Debian Linux, based on Bionic, Ubuntu Linux, based on Alpine, which is tiny. It's a five megabyte Linux, very small. Um, the other one that's on there that I, I do actually use quite a lot is uh, ms-sql server-linux, um, which is SQL Server running inside a Docker container, uh, which is very nice, because it means I can, if I mess up my database, I can just delete the whole server and then start a new one, and it's all better again. So to develop with Docker, you have to work with two things. One is a Docker file, and then the other, which is not absolutely necessary, but will make your life an awful lot easier, is Docker Compose. A Docker file is really just a recipe for a piece of functionality for an application. At the moment, we use Docker files to build Docker images, which we then push to a registry, and then we pull them from our Docker runtime system, and we use those to start containers. But really, a Docker file is just a recipe for how to put an application together in a way that it can run anywhere. And if I can get an application running in a Docker container on my machine, if I then push that same image to a repository somewhere, a registry somewhere, and then run it on another machine, it should theoretically run just as well. The only catch in there being external dependencies. So I might have an external dependency that is available on my machine that isn't available in the target environment. But apart from that, I'm not going to get any conflicts over .NET Framework versions or uh, IIS versions or, or any of those other things. Docker files are really, really simple these days. Uh, so I have the Docker file for live is here. That's the whole thing. It all fits on the screen. Uh, we say use the um, Microsoft.NET big long tag thing at the end there. So that's the SDK version. Uh, it's the release candidate one of the 2.1 SDK. And the bionic bit at the end there means it's using the Ubuntu bionic base image. And then we're going to create a code directory on there and change into that. Copy the contents of my local directory on this machine into that code directory. And then run uh, CD into the project directory. And then run .NET publish. Uh, give it an output target and then a configuration release. 
Then we have another from, and if you haven't played with Docker recently, you might not have seen this. This is a multi-stage build. So the SDK image is nearly two gigabytes. It got smaller because they removed node from it. Uh, but you don't want to be pushing two gigabyte images into your production cluster because some of these are very small virtual machines and they don't have a lot of disk space. So we have a runtime image which only has the bare minimum runtime dependencies and the runtime version of the .NET executable as opposed to the SDK version. The only thing that the runtime version can do is run a DLL. And so we use the runtime image. We copy the output from our build image onto the runtime image. We set the work directory to slash app, and then we set the entry point here to .NET and decublive.dll. Okay, that creates our image. So that will create an image called deckhub slash web with a version number on the end of it when I do a build. To run that, I can do docker run and pass a bunch of parameters over to it, but I've got like a dozen different services here. If I want to get the entire system running on my machine, then I've got a lot of docker runs to do, and so there's something called docker compose, which lets me spin everything up and make the connections and specify the um, connection strings and everything else in a single YAML file. And that looks like this. So this sits outside the uh, various different GitHub directories. And this just uh, lets me say, okay, so I need to, if I need to do a build, then there's a Docker file in dot slash live, and you can build the image. You can give it this tag here. If the tag already exists, don't worry about it. Just use the one that's already there. I can specify some environment variables in there. Um, I can specify the network. I can say this depends on the database and Redis, although it doesn't depend on the database, so I'll just get rid of that. And then I have uh, some labels here which are used with a Docker image called traffic. Traffic is a web proxy written in Go that can actually listen to the Docker runtime, and when a container starts up, looks to see if there are labels and if there are, then it uh, uses those to start routing traffic. Um, it is routing here anything that goes to the host microstuff.io will get routed to this um, service unless it finds another service uh, with a higher priority, like identity, for example, which specifies a path prefix of slash identity and has a priority of 200. So that will win over the web side of things. Microstuff.io is a domain that I own and its uh, DNS record has two entries, microstuff.io and wildcard.microstuff.io and both of them point to 127.0.0.1 and will do. So if you're ever working locally and you want an actual domain to play with instead of just local host, just use microstuff.io, it will work. You're welcome. There you go. Free gifts for everybody. Okay, and then down at the bottom here, we have uh, the various dependencies that are necessary for this as well. Um, <clears throat> so we have our DB, which is the Postgres Alpine image and there we're setting the username and password using environment variables. We have the traffic image, we've got a Redis image, we've got an influx DB image and a chronograph image in there as well, just to make sure those things are working. Okay. With that, I can do Docker Compose up and the entire microservice is architecture application just spins up on my machine along with the dependencies and I can test everything make sure it all works locally and I can use that for doing integration testing before I push things up into the actual production cluster. In production, we don't use Docker itself, we use Kubernetes. Kubernetes is like another layer of abstraction on top of Docker. I'm sure you've heard all about it by now. It is, uh, for a while there, there was Docker Swarm, there was Mesosphere, there was DCOS, there was Marathon, 
Uh, there were lots of different options for orchestration. And then suddenly, towards the end of last year, Kubernetes just won. Uh, last I checked, you couldn't encrypt secrets in a Compose or Docker file. Has that changed? Uh, supposed to just use the managed orchestrators. You cannot encrypt secrets in a Docker file or in Docker Compose. You don't keep your secrets. Um, you could have that Docker Compose file. That's only the secrets for when I'm running locally. Those are not the ones that go into production. Um, I'll talk about the secrets that go into production in a little while. Uh, could a serverless app also be cloud native? Are they by default? They sort of are, really, um, because it's difficult to run a serverless app outside of the cloud. And when you're building this sort of thing, you might have a bunch of ASP.NET Core microservices and say to yourself, I need this to be in, uh, I, you know, I want to be able to build this and test it locally and everything else. But you might have something that is so piffingly small, it's literally just six lines of code, then by all means put that into Azure Functions or AWS Lambda. So serverless can be part of your cloud native application. It's just difficult to run that locally. Okay, so for running Kubernetes, um, you have various options. Uh, the three major cloud providers all now have Kubernetes as a service. Azure has AKS, which is their second generation managed container orchestration service. The first one did Docker Swarm mode and DCOS as well. The new one just does Kubernetes. Uh, the nice thing with that is that they don't charge you for the control plane. So they only charge you for the nodes which are actually running your code, not the nodes which are running the other nodes. Uh, Google have Google Container Engine, also spelt with a K. Uh, same idea, you don't pay for the management nodes, you just pay for the things that you're running. Amazon have uh, EKS, which is their second generation managed cloud. Again, uh, as I think you don't pay for the control plane with AKS, uh, with EKS. Um, it's not entirely clear from their documentation. Uh, and of course, you can spin up your own Kubernetes cluster, which I absolutely strongly recommend you do not do, because it's very, very complicated. You have to set up an etcd distributed service and all sorts of very complicated things. And uh, yeah, just, just don't. Just let somebody else do it for you. Unless you're running on-prem, in which case let ops do it for you. Um, DevOps doesn't spin up the Kubernetes cluster. Ops spin up the Kubernetes cluster, then DevOps use the Kubernetes cluster. Um, so Kubernetes concepts, you have clusters, which is your big bunch of machines that are all joined together and working in unison. And the machines within those are referred to as nodes. And then the things that you run on your cluster are called workloads. And there are lots of different kinds of workloads. So you have stateful services and stateless services and deployments and various other things. And then the actual containers themselves run inside pods. So most of the other orchestration systems just had containers. So you would run a container. And then uh, that, an instance of that container would be scheduled across multiple different nodes. Kubernetes has pods. Most pods will just have one container inside them, but you can have two or three containers inside a single pod. Kubernetes will guarantee that those containers are always scheduled onto the same node together, and they can see each other over the local host as opposed to needing to know each other's IP addresses. There are lots of reasons why you might want to do that. Using Kubernetes, it's quite scary at first, but once you get your head around the basic principles, um, it becomes a lot more uh, friendly and straightforward, and eventually it's just the way you do things. Uh, it's almost all done using the kubectl command line tool, which is a single self-contained executable. Um, as an example, when I want to create a new Kubernetes cluster in Azure, I do az aks create and specify a couple of parameters for the resource group and the location and everything else. I then do az aks get dash credentials. And then after that's finished running, kubectl is suddenly magically pointing at my new cluster in my Azure data center. And at that point, I can start using kubectl to apply configurations from YAML files on my machine to my cluster. 
So let's take a quick look at the cube code for my uh, Deck Hub application. So I've got the top level stuff sits in a separate um, directory on here, and we have uh, Deck Hub namespace. So we just create a namespace called Deck Hub to keep everything separate. So you, you might have multiple separate um, applications running in a Kubernetes cluster. You can namespace them to keep their dependencies separate from each other. So I can have Redis in the Deck Hub namespace and have a completely other Redis in a completely separate namespace and be sure that they're not going to overlap with each other. Here is the Redis deployment file and that's just saying go and get this version of Redis from the uh, re registry and run it and then expose it as a service with the Redis label and uh, the Redis name. Now anything inside the Deck Hub namespace can just go, oi, Redis, and they will get that service back. Um, running multiple instances of Redis in a Kubernetes cluster is much more complicated and there's lots of documentation on how to do that because you have to essentially spin one up and then make sure that another one's running on a different node as a slave and then, yeah, whatever it is with Redis. If you need that sort of stuff, then just start using Redis as a service from your favorite cloud provider. And then we have the Nginx Ingress um, set up here. This is the, where a lot of the magic happens. So <clears throat> Kubernetes has the idea of an ingress controller. When a request comes in and hits the load balancer and then hits the cluster, how does it decide which service inside the cluster it's going to route that request to? does that using an ingress controller. The ingress controller, when you're running on Azure, AKS, for example, um, you can actually say, create a load balancer, and it will create an Azure level five load balancer for you and hook itself up to it, and then you attach labels to everything else, similar to the traffic labels that we had in the Docker Compose file that talk to the Nginx ingress controller and say, please route traffic accordingly. Um, the Lego uh, item in there is slightly deprecated now and I haven't updated it yet, but that does let's encrypt automatically. Um, it's let's encrypt and then go because it's written in go because of course it is because you don't need generics to do let's encrypt. Um, okay, so then if we go into live, you can see that live has got a cube file in there as well and in here, uh, we say, okay, so here's my image that I built and pushed to my registry. I want you to pull that down, and here are my uh, environment variables in here. So here's my Redis host and my influx server. All my non-secure uh, keys are held in there, um, and my container port, and then I have my service entry here so that I can say this is the Deck Hub service, or this is the web service within Deck Hub. And then I have my ingress settings down here, which says expose this to the Nginx ingress controller. Um, and when a request comes in for deckhub.app, then route the requests through to here. Um, so to go back to the encrypted secrets, Kubernetes actually has secrets as a first class uh, citizen. So you can go to Kubernetes and say, create a secret. There are actually three kinds of secrets. Um, you've got a registry secret, which gives it permission to pull from private registries. Uh, you've got a TLS secret, which lets you put in a certificate and key file for when you want to do um, SSL. And you have generic secrets, which is what most of these are. So I have a generic secret called API key which has a value inside it called hash phrase. And here, I'm just saying take the value from that secret, which is encrypted at rest in Kubernetes, and set it into an environment variable inside this container. And that environment variable then overrides the ASP.NET Core configuration that's in appsettings.json or wherever else it might be. Um, and if you go and look through, you'll see there are lots of different secrets in there and no, I have not checked my secrets file into GitHub because that would be stupid. Um, but I will, at some point, remember to check in an example secrets file with 
uh, instructions for filling in your own secrets for your own databases. Okay, so that's Kubernetes. And then, yes, so everything in, oh, um, extra tip for this, Entity Framework Core has uh, migrations. So you can say, right, I want you to take, I got my object model, and I'm gonna say .NET EF um, migrations add initial create to do my initial migration. Then you start the thing running. With EF6, if you were doing model first, you would generally, while, the, while your ASP.NET application was starting up, you would say uh, context.insure database, which would make sure that the migrations had been run. That doesn't work particularly well in EF core. Um, insure database is still there, and it does create the tables. What it doesn't do is create the migrations history table. So when you then change your model and try and do it again, it'll just explode. Uh, what you actually have to do is do a try, update database, and then catch the exception, and if it's the exception that says it's already been updated, then ignore it. So that's one thing. The other thing is when do you run this? Because in the old days when you were bringing up um, maybe two instances of an application on a web farm using Octopus Deploy, you could control how these things were running and you could make sure that the migration only ran once. If you're deploying 15 instances of an application all at the same time, then they're gonna go to the database and say, has the migration been run? And it might only be three of them that actually get to this point at the same time. And the database comes back and says, no, it hasn't. And then all three of them start trying to migrate the database at the same time. That's not fun. So what I do is I put my actual entity framework context and model classes into a separate application. I'll show you um, an example of this using the identity code. Um, so I pulled out the data context, so my application DB context and my application user and a couple of other bits and pieces that they need have been pulled into a separate um, class library application. This class library application actually doesn't know what the real database is. So this doesn't know about PostgreSQL. Uh, this will work against any database. Um, I then reference that class library in my actual web application, and I also reference it in a console application that just does this. So <clears throat> creates a logger factory. Uh, I created a package called migration helper, which I put on NuGet. Um, which you are absolutely free to download and use. And uh, you just say, await new migration helper, give it the logger factory, uh, dot try migrate and pass in the command line arguments. So you can pass the connection string in as the first command line argument and then just log finish when it's done. And it uses something called the design time application DB context factory to work out how to run your migration you have to have that in there for the .NET EF um, migrations add command to work anyway. So that runs, and then the cube directory for um, this component actually has an additional file, and this is another kind of workload in Kubernetes called a job. And a job, you say to Kubernetes, run this, and it runs it, and it stops, and then it's done and it just cleans itself up. Um, so this is great. You run this once, and you know that your migrations are running, and they only run once, and you can check from your logs to make sure that it ran successfully. So this runs while the 15 instances of your actual application are all starting up. So this is a really nice pattern for running EF core migrations in a cloud-native environment. So, we got our microservices, we split them all up in interesting ways, they're sharing their cookies, they're all running on uh, Kubernetes in whichever cloud platform we like, and now we have the challenge of working out whether everything's okay, is it all running all right, is it working? Um, and so obviously, to get into this world, you want to make sure that you are logging and monitoring and recording as much information as you possibly can. Um, is it running? Is it running fast enough? 
Is anything getting overloaded? Is anything running too hot? Has anything broken? What the hell is going on inside this cluster? And again, this is something, I'm running three nodes here. It's not actually that complicated. But you pretty soon get to the point in bigger applications where you're running 100 nodes and you might have five different applications running across there and you've got servers being taken down and brought back in and everything else. You, you do need to be able to see what's going on. And so we have a bunch of tools that are useful for this. Um, the four that I lean on the most are Prometheus, which is a monitoring and metrics database, um, and Influx Data, which is also a monitoring and metrics database, but it works slightly differently. Prometheus keeps asking things on your cluster, is everything okay, how's it going? And they respond with formatted data, and then Prometheus puts that into the database, which is great for working out that a service has crashed, because if you go, how's it going, and it goes, then you can go, right, that's crashed. Influx works the more traditional way, where the service just keeps pushing information into Influx. So I like to use Prometheus for monitoring the cluster and making sure that all the nodes and everything are okay, and then Influx for my internal application metrics, how long are requests taking, that sort of thing. Um, they're two different databases for two different purposes. Influx is better at dealing with um, arbitrary tags attached to each data point. So you can say this came from, this, uh, this URL was what was requested, um, maybe a, a user hash, uh, a correlation key or whatever. Elasticsearch is a cheap and easy way of doing your logging. Um, Elasticsearch with Kibana over the top of it. And then there's also containership.io, which is a free service um, where you can just give it access to your Kubernetes cluster and it will give you lots of lovely information about what's happening in there automagically. So, um, this is my uh, Influx database. This is Grafana, which is a charting and dashboarding application that runs over the top of it. And these are my lovely colorful charts that I have in there that tell me that everything's going okay on my uh, cluster. Um, to do that, I am using a library, so to actually get the data out of my application and into Influx, I'm using a library called App Metrics, which is based on a very um, well-established and well-respected library from the Java world uh, called just Metrics, uh, which is used in uh, various different frameworks written by Coda Hale. Uh, a guy called Al Hardy has ported this over to .NET and it runs on .NET Core. Adding it into your code is incredibly simple. Um, it is literally just a matter of uh, in program.cs. So you install the various packages and say, use standard metrics. Um, and along with some various settings inside uh, your app settings.json file, that's it. That, that's now, I've added that line, all my metrics are going out to influx. So that works very nicely. And then the other um, component here is containership. Containership is free for developers. Um, there's no limit on how many nodes you can have or anything like that. And uh, all they ask is that if you start using it on your production servers, then you talk to their salespeople and they'll sell you a support plan. But in here I can see, so I've got my hub, I just have a single instance of my hub. I've got, uh, you can also see all the containers running the old version of this application, which used to be called Slidable, but nobody could spell that, so I renamed it to Deck Hub. Um, <clears throat> so yes, we can see that I brought this current version of Deck Hub identity up five hours ago, and if I go into details here, I can see how much memory uh, that's using, that's using 600 megabytes, that should be okay. I can see the pods that are running inside that service, and I can view the details of those pods. I can see the single container that's running inside those pods, and if I go into the container, I can actually see the logs coming out of there as well, and the various errors that have been happening, um, which were because I'd forgotten to uh, turn the Twitter authentication um, service on in the Twitter dashboard. Okay. So yes, um, app-metrics.io. App oh, the other really nice thing about app metrics is because he writes this data into your database and he decides what everything's going to be called. Um, so this uh, lovely dashboard here 
Um, he created this dashboard and uploaded it to Grafana Labs, and it has the ID 2520. And so you can just go to your Grafana and say import a dashboard and type in 2520, and you get this suddenly appears, and it makes you look enormously clever um, when you're talking to your boss about what kind of metrics you've got covering your services and everything else. And you can build your own custom dashboard, so I have uh, other dashboards which I haven't moved over yet for how many current service bus, uh, not service bus, signal R connections are there? Okay. Um, platform services is just things like databases and blob storage and messaging and persistent cache. Um, so, like I said, I'm running Redis inside the cluster because it's a cheap and cheerful way of doing that. If you wanted to use Redis and have it be more robust, then you would use something like Azure Redis Service. Um, or one of the other sort of Redis as a services on the other platforms. Uh, messaging, uh, so blob storage, I'm using blob storage. The slide service is so small that it would take me five minutes to write another version of the slide service that used S3 storage, and then I would just have two different images, so slides-blob and slides-s3, and I would decide which one I wanted to use based on which environment I was running in. So you can actually use the containers and uh, images idea almost as dependency injection, almost as uh, I will put this thing together from, from Lego pieces according to where I'm running. Uh, messaging is using service bus, but service bus uh, supports AMQP, so you can just as well use the AMQP protocol to talk to service bus, and then you could replace that with RabbitMQ or um, another service. And uh, persistent cache, uh, so if you wanted persistent caching, then you could use something like Azure Redis uh, or some other service like that. Everything that actually records data where you want kind of reliable uh, duplication, replication, failover, that sort of stuff, you want to be using external services, platform services for those. Um, and DevOps, uh, well, it's 1723, which means you're here three minutes after the conference has finished. Um, so we don't have time to talk about DevOps, but we were never going to. Uh, there are lots of other people talking about DevOps, and you can go and talk to them. So that's it. That's my very quick whirlwind tour of my cloud native application. All the code is on GitHub at github.com slash deckhub app. Like I say, it's completely MIT licensed. Download it, play with it. If you want to contribute to it, that would be awesome. If you want to rip bits out of it and use them in your own applications, that's completely fine as well. It's just there as a reference application for everybody to get started with. I hope that was useful. I hope you've had a great conference. I hope that NDC comes back here next year. If they do, I will, and I hope that I will see you all then. Thank you very much.